Thank you very much and welcome to the WA Museum in Geraldton. If you haven't been to one of our public lectures before, my name is Catherine Belcher and I'm the Regional Manager. And I'd like to thank you for um, joining us this evening for the second of our Harry Butler in the Wild lecture series to celebrate 2010 International Year of Biodiversity. Tonight we are joined by Shirley Slack-Smith, who is the curator of mollusks at the WA Museum um, as part of the Aquatic Zoology Department. Shirley has been a primary school teacher, a researcher. Uh, she began her museum career at the Museum of Victoria and she has been with the WA Museum Department of Marine Invertebrates on and off for quite some, some years. I've been um, completely jealous of her professional career. It's taken her to all around the world, including um, the Indo-West Pacific region, such as Papua New Guinea, Indonesia, Malaysia. Um, and she's also been to the islands of the Southwest Indian Ocean, such as Madagascar, Mauritius and the Seychelles, generally working with scientists in those countries and, and studying, studying mollusks. Um, she, as of this month, her and her colleague have put out uh, the second edition of the Field Guide to Sea Stingers, and that will be um, available in the museum shop probably by early next week. So it gives me great pleasure to um, welcome Shirley to Geraldton and for her to talk to you tonight on seashells of Western Australia. So thank you, Shirley. Thank you, Catherine. This is going to take a little while for me to get used to this sort of double speak. So um, please forgive me if... Uh, uh, it gets a bit odd. <laughs> um, this evening I wanted to speak, as the title suggests, about the seashells of Western Australia, which really tells you nothing, I know that, uh, but I couldn't think of anything more upmarket. Uh, and so I, uh, I'll, I'll start, if we can turn things on, uh, with a map that you're undoubtedly well familiar with, all of you except visitors, I suppose. I just put that up there to remind us what a long coastline we have, if we needed any reminding, not only on the mainland of Western Australia, but on all the islands, uh, particularly those in the north. Uh, uh, next one, thanks. And, uh, but the point I put that up was to try and illustrate that, uh, leading on to the talking about the currents that prevail in our area of Australia, particularly. Uh, before I zoom in on Western Australia, uh, I just wanted to point out, because um, I thought it was rather a neat diagram, that you know when you get down south of the equator, the currents go around in an anti-clockwise direction, go up north, and looking at it from our point of view anyhow, they go around in a clockwise direction. And so what it means is that the and this is true for the Pacific and the Indian Ocean, and it is also true for the Atlantic Ocean over here. Um, but the, zooming in on the uh, Pacific, South Pacific and South Indian Oceans, uh, as you can see, this is rather, it's a very simplified diagram, of course, but the water's coming across the top here uh, and, and across there. But the difference about the... Um, this particular area here from that near the continents of the Americas and in the, and the continent of Africa is that there is a passageway across here, unlike, well, there's the Panama Canal, but I don't think we count that, and there's nothing, of course, across Africa. So that this water coming across here builds up and flows through here, um, and it actually, in a good season... Uh, builds up to the point where it is quite a lot higher than usual, a lot deeper. And, uh, and that depth of that water inclines it to run downhill down our Western Australian coast, just, just like water running down a gutter. And uh, that's, uh, that makes the western side of Australia and the current system there completely different from, say, the western side of South America or the western side of Africa where the currents are flowing towards the equator on a 
on the western side. So we're a little bit different and, and, and uh, it has great implications for the uh, marine fauna of those areas, um, not just the mollusks. Thank you. Um, I, I also just wanted to point out, for, <laughs> mostly because I did this originally for some kids and some people in India, uh, and I wanted to point out that the, uh, the marine environment of our coasts is drastically affected by what's on the land these days, uh, currently, um, and it has been in the past, of course. And so the dry, arid country uh, has an effect on what happens on the coast and the waters off the coast. Uh, we, as you know, we have very few mountains in Western Australia of any height at all, uh, and uh, so we don't have those uh, inputs into our coastal waters that are very common in some of the other continents, uh, and um, particularly the western sides of those continents. So we uh, find that we now have um, very little sediment flowing into the sea. But at one time it was very different. At one time in the past, in the dis far distant past, when the climate of Australia was much more, much less arid, uh, it is, was, there was a lot of water flowing into the sea. And even before that, there was thick ice deposits uh, over most of the land masses that then made up with uh, Western Australia. And those, that ice actually wore away the tops of the, um, the highlands and contributed to the uh, amount of sediment, contributed greatly to the amount of sediment that was flowing down, that later flowed down into the sea and, and the coastal areas. Thank you. Originally, as, as I'm sure you all know, uh, Australia was um, attached to this, these other parts of what we call Gondwana. Uh, it was firmly, fairly firmly attached to Antarctica. Um, it had been fairly firmly attached to India, but at this stage that this diagram represents, India has split away from Australia and has started to move up towards what became the north. Um, but, uh, and so, uh, we, and after that happened, then this canal along here started to open up from the west and, and gradually got across to the east. Later on, the other climates moved, uh, continents moved off. The last one to move off was South America. Uh, and it wasn't until South America actually moved away from Antarctica uh, that it left the, uh, allowed the water to circulate around Antarctica and give us what we now call the southern uh, currents, uh, the, the uh, circumpolar currents in the South uh, Oceans. Thank you. So in Western Australia we have um, a mixture of areas. We have areas that were the ancient land forms, the really ones that were there for a long, long time, and they're called the Cratons, or, and include the Kimberley Block, the ones right up, right down the south. The, the largest of those land masses was the Ilgarn Craton, which is the one that uh, goes down in the south, southern part of our state, uh, and it was it was one of those areas that was greatly affected by the um, ice sheets and the wearing away by the ice sheets to the extent that uh, it shaved off a tremendous amount, a tremendous thickness from that craton, the surface of that craton. And so the, the sediment that came down formed the, the coastal, the basins that are down here, the sedimentary rocks that are formed by the sediments from the land and the sea, down on the Eucla and Gun Barrel Basins, the Gun Barrel being more to the northeast, and then the Perth and Carnarvon basins, which includes the Geraldton area, and further north in the, in the Pilbara and up into the Kimberley. Uh, thank you. 
And so nowadays, we, with our well-known map, we can see that this was the Yulgarn Craton area, right around here, um, and the other Cratons up, up in these areas. Uh, was set, uh, separated by these sedimentary areas, huge areas that were filled up by all the sediment that drained down at that time. Um, the other thing that happened at the, in, at the end of the Ice Age, which was about 10,000 years ago, I better keep away from this thing, um, is that uh, the, uh, the sea, which had been at a very low level, in fact roughly corresponding to the edge of this, this uh, blue area, which is the, um, which is the, excuse me, uh, the area that we call the continental shelf, fairly wide down in the south, narrow around here and up there. When you get to about Geraldton, it's getting a little bit wider, it gets very wide up around the, um, off the the Pilbara and, and at Western Kimberley, and of course joins up almost, except for a trench, with that of the Indonesian archipelago. Uh, the, as the uh, sea started to come in, as the ice melted and the sea started to come in, that was when uh, we, the coastline, as we now see it, was defined. Uh, and so on. Excuse me. So uh, at that time, there had been very deep gullies, such as the one round Perth from the Darling Range. Uh, and that, that gully, that very deep gully, has been filled in by sediments so that we now get the Swan River, which is not a very deep river. Um, but down below the, the uh, base of the, the river, it, the mud goes down, 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 down. Until uh, and that obviously was a very very deep uh, ravine at that, where it opened up to the sea. Thank you. So what we have now, um, really basically, we have um, the warm water in. The, uh, I'm, I'm simplifying this only because I get through it faster. Um, we have the warm water up here from the uh, province of the central Indo-Pacific and we have the cooler water here with the influence of the southern uh, ocean and we have an area of overlap coming up here right from about northwest Cape down to around about Cape Lewin and as you would realise of course Geraldton is about smack in the middle. Um, next one, thanks. Uh, there's the, the point of that, uh, of, of mentioning that, is that it's, um, we have the uh, coastal current systems operating in those areas and that overlap is due to an overlap of the actual currents. Um, the, uh, the one coming from the north, from the waters between Australia and Indonesia, uh, is the Lewin current, uh, which we hear a great deal these days, um, and it's coming from a, a place, an area, where the water is about a half a metre um, uh, higher than the rest of the area around there. It's stronger in winter, mostly because that southern equatorial, that equatorial current coming across just south of the equator in the Pacific Ocean works faster at that particular time uh, and it, the water it carries with it uh, it's, it spills down on our coastline to the north and, and uh, to varying degrees to the south is warm water, gets cooler as it comes south of course um, the actual water cools down I mean, it, it's not just mixing um, and it's very nutrient poor for some reason so it's not really great water for animals to be living in. Um, it's less saline than is the norm for seawater. Uh, and it flows around about, up to about half a metre a second. So it's pushing down. Uh, that varies, that speed varies from time to time with what's happening up in the Pacific Ocean um, and further north. 
uh, and it has little eddies and jets that come off uh, at different places, and that varies with time, with season and from year to year. Um, counteracting that is a much weaker current that's flowing from round about Cape Lou and Cape Naturalist area, and it's pushed mostly by the winds that uh, uh, operate down in that area. And that particular current, because the winds in that area are stronger in summer, uh, it, it, that current is, has an impetus that it lacks at other times of the year. Uh, and it flows up, but it flows up closer to the coastline than does the Lewin current. So it sort of hugs the coastline as it comes up. Uh, it can, um, it has, as I said, the cooler water from the Southern Ocean, and it has a higher nutrient load with the upwelling that it, upwellings that it encounters on the way. Could I have the next one, please? Um, and so uh, we have these two current systems acting in opposition, one affecting the other. Actually, because the Lewin current is such a strong current, it's the one that does most of the affecting and it pushes the other one down. So at places like Perth and at, and at Geraldton, uh, you might have noticed that the water on our coastal areas is a bit cooler than it is only a little way offshore. In the case of Perth, the difference is quite noticeable between Perth and Rottnest Island. Uh, and here at Gerald, in the Geraldton area, it's certainly um, a good deal different between the uh, area around Geraldton north and south and the Abrolhos Islands. Um, <coughs> but I must stress also that this um, effect um, of, of the two waters flowing next to one another but in opposite directions um, does vary with depth. It depends on how strong they, both of those currents are as to how deep down under the surface they operate. Um, and it also, as I said before, varies with time. Uh, and the routes ch change slightly from year to year. So people who are interested in, in fisheries biology. Um, so we have the, the two sets, or three sets of conditions really uh, operating. We have the northern ones, the mixtures, and the southern situations. Up north, we have two tides a day, two very noticeable tides a day up in the Kimberleys and Pilbara areas. Um, and they, those are so noticeable because the tidal range uh, extends up to about 12 metres. Um, and they, uh, but down, once you get down to this area, that effect is starting to um, be wiped out. And uh, by the time you get down to about oh well, Geraldton down to Perth and beyond. It's right down to uh, uh, only less than one metre in, in the tidal range. Uh, and really sometimes you can't even tell that there's another tide. The, the people who work the instruments that measure this sort of thing, they can pick it out mostly, um, pick out a little sort of dip uh, during the day but mostly we're confined to the single tide. And that timing of that tide change in the south, here in Geraldton and further south, is largely affected by atmospheric conditions, as you might have noticed. So we usually have our low tides early in the morning uh, in summer, and once the westerly wind comes in, the water comes up, it doesn't matter what time the tide was supposed to change. Uh, be beyond the shallow waters, shallow coastal waters, we go out across the continental shelf, down the continental slope, and down into abyssal waters. And we um, don't know very much about those, but they don't seem to show the same patterns because when you once you get down to the deep waters of the of the continental slope and down to the abyss abyssal areas, um, the temperature there of the, uh, that operates, the head temperature system, is very, very stable. It doesn't change much from some, there's no summer and winter 
difference and so on. It's cold, definitely cold, but it's, um, it's stable, which is an oddball thing. And one of the oddball consequences of that is that sometimes tropical species come down from the uh, shallow water where they live up in the Indonesian, Malaysian area, and they'll go down into deeper water off our coast, and not because they suddenly like have changed their mind and like the um, the cold water, but because they uh, it's it's um, steady. The temperature is steady, and that presume it seems to be a more desirable character than the actual temperature itself. Um, I put this in just to remind us, because I'll be going on to something that looks a bit better than this in a moment. Um, is that <laughs> sorry? Is that the the substrates are very important for the creatures that live in the sea? Obviously, there's hard substrates like rocks and various sorts of rocks, it's, and goes from one place to another. Uh, there are um, other hard substrates like mangrove. Um, trees and so on that live in certain areas as we know of, much more abundant in the Kimberley and Pilbara dribbling out when we get down to the Abrolis and then there's one little outpost down at Bunbury, the next little outpost and that's it. But other, apart from those uh, hard substrates there are the man-made ones like jetty piles and so on which um, are quite important actually as you might, some of you might have noticed, if you ever swum round the um, the jetties uh, uh, in this area, I gather you're not supposed to go down to the um, to the uh, near the uh, harbour these days, um, which was a pity because that was a great place to find uh, all sorts of things. And the soft substrates, of course, are the beaches, uh, intertidal beaches, and the shallows beyond usually sandy bottoms, very clear sandy bottoms along this stretch of the coast, um, interspersed with uh, rocky reefs, remnants of dunes, sand dunes, when the, when the tide was way out in the, in the uh, ice ages, uh, and those, sand, uh, those sandy um, ridges, under, underwater ridges, uh, run parallel, roughly parallel to the coast, uh, and divided up so that in between them you have very sheltered waters uh, in which um, sometimes mud does accumulate if there's a strong flow down any of the rivers uh, nearby. But the rivers, of course, the mud particularly is more no much more noticeable in actual estuaries and embayments and, and among the mangles, of course. Thanks. So getting back to a bit more, <laughs> something that looks a bit better. So the, the habitats that we have um, along the coast range from um, scenes like this up in the Kimberleys where we have these, uh, this, these um, very high hills now interspersed with water um, uh, and mostly rocky areas. Um, very few um, sand, long sandy beaches and so on. And th as I said before, this high tidal, this large tidal range uh, where the water squishes in and out and makes whirlpools and all those things that tourists like to go and see. Thank you. Uh, the offshore reefs, uh, of which we've been hearing a good deal lately, mostly because of the... Um, the prospecting for oil and the, the proposals to, uh, to um, tap that oil and gas offshore. And so a lot of the reefs there uh, of, are of significance now, uh, of greater significance now than they were in the past because of the prospect of some of them being maybe flooded at some time by oil or gas or whatever. And uh, so there's a lot of surveying going on in those tropical reefs at the moment. Uh, this is just when it's low tide. That's the, that's the only reason they're up and, and dry, I was dry clothing on. Other times when the tide comes in, of course, they're diving. Thank you. And then, of course, in the Kimberleys and coming down to the Pilbara, there are these mangroves, particularly 
uh, in estuaries, but also along quite open shores at times, depending on the input of fresh water, underground fresh water, largely. Thank you. As we come further south, we come to areas where uh, the rocks, instead of being the igneous rocks that you get in the, in the Kimberley, like, for the most part, are uh, basic, uh, are generally limestone rocks, uh, leftovers from, as I say, sand dunes, when the sand dunes were so much higher than the rocks are now, so that the weight of the, all this sand above them pressed down and, com and led to the compaction of the lower layers of sand into this limestone rock that we uh, experience along our coasts here and further south. Thank you. Um, and so we have uh, this limestone rocks with the, the uh, reefs running parallel, as you might see here, to the coast, to the beaches. And in between we have these fairly shallow but calmer waters, uh, for the most part, uh, in which sea grasses can grow um, and flourish. Thank you. And this is not a bad bed of seagrass. Um, it's a bit further south, just a bit further south than here, um, down around Durian Bay, actually. But um, it's, the seagrass is an extremely important part of the habitat. It's a habitat within itself, uh, as important as the mangles, for, um, for nurturing uh, for providing food for lots and lots of t different types of marine creatures uh, and shelter and protection from predators and so on. Uh, extremely important, thanks. But, so what we have, and it's particularly noticeable in this area of Geraldton, the central coast, is that we've got two lots of habitats, one inshore, one offshore, quite, quite a good deal of difference between them, um, and each holding a, an incredible variety of uh, species. Uh, both have um, a fauna, whether it's a fauna of mollusks or of any other type of marine, marine creature, uh, that is extremely varied. So it's one of the most, um, uh, most diverse of the faunas of anywhere around the Australian coast in this particular stretch here. Uh, and that we have, I just put this up in case I use words that people are not familiar with, I use gastropods and there's creatures like these periwinkles and cowries, cone shells and nudibranchs, they're the sea slugs, those colourful ones, bivalves like mussels and oysters and the like, kephalopods like squids and cuttlefish and, and uh, and octopus. Chitons, I won't have much to say about them because not very much is known about them actually. Um, they're coated male shells that instead of having one shell or two shells like a bivalve, they have eight shells which make them, they allow them to bend. Uh, and if, there's a couple of other smaller groups which are mostly um, deeper water uh, species. Thank you. And so it leads us to wonder how um, this diversity of the fauna can persist. What, what methods? What, what methods have evolved? What, and what forms have evolved uh, to be able to cope with this degree of competition that is going on all the time? Uh, and there are the methods that. Um, seem to be most important, the way they cope with this competition, uh, the ways, way in which the animals get their food, what sort of food they get and, and how they do it, um, the breeding patterns of the organisms and the way in which they protect themselves. Because it's, one mustn't imagine, just seeing shells on the beach for instance, that it's, it's a nice peaceful environment down there, it really is life being raw in tooth and claw type stuff, um, you know, if you're not trying to eat something else, something else is trying to eat you. Thank you. So we have, in the feeding, we have these very, I'll go through them in a moment, 
uh, these various types of procedures that the animals, the mollusks anyhow, have adopted to um, divide up the environment so that they each get a bit of it and so those species of, of this high diversity can coexist. Thanks. Um, the, the very common ones, particularly in the inshore areas along our coast here, um, uh, are the, uh, the razor clams. And they live in this in these sort of fairly um, uh, quiet waters between the the limestone reefs that run parallel to the coast. They burrow down, they bury themselves into the sand, usually finding a little stone or rock or something underneath to anchor themselves to, um, and they uh, project above it. They're called razor clams, obviously, because if you tread on them, you get a cut foot. Um, which does ta actually take quite a while to heal usually. But they, they have gills inside their bodies in between their shells. Um, they have muscles, they have heart, they have reproductive organs and excretory organs. And this all has to fit in this fairly small space in here. Um, and they, they draw in a tremendous current which go, goes, the gills have little hairs on them which, which draw in the current of water. And as the water goes through the uh, net-like gills, the food in the water, the planktonic organisms, the organisms that float around the water, are extracted and then passed up to the, the, the mouth and eaten. Next one, please. And along, and somewhat related to those, uh, but they don't look anything like, are things like the giant clams. We don't have them in general. I mean, there's always the odd one, I suppose. But in general, they're out at the Abrolhos and then they're much further north uh, from here, not much further south. Well, not at all further south. And these are very large, heavy shells, uh, lots of body inside it. This is a picture from above, taken looking down through the water. Um, and the, as you probably have seen plenty of pictures, the, the soft material... Uh, of the, the soft tissues are usually brightly coloured. Part of that colour, but only part of it, is due to the minute algae, algal cells that live in their tissues. They're actually in their tissues, in the, in the, um, the spaces, the sinuses in their tissues, and they live there. And that's the reason why giant clams live upside down, so their joined valves are down below, they, so they can open their valves up out wide and the sun can get to those tissues and to the algal cells which live in them. And so those algal cells, like our garden plants, with the help of the sunlight, can um, turn carbon dioxide and water uh, into, um, into food, uh, into carbohydrates, which then nourish the giant clams. So most of the giant clams that we have, there are about six species, uh, around in Australian waters, uh, up north from here, um, are, uh, don't filter their food. They simply uh, subsist on the food that is provided by these algal, you could call them pal parasites, more symbionts. So they live uh, getting benefit, each one getting benefit from the other. Thank you. Other, another group of algal eaters are things like the abalone. This is this, what's called the staircase abalone. Um, uh, lives from about the Abolis off, I think from Shark Bay southwards, but certainly along our coast, uh, the more coastal waters. It's a cooler water. Uh, it goes around the southern coast of Australia. It, it needs the cooler waters and it lives along our coasts here. Um, and it walks around Mostly at night, I must admit, otherwise it's, it'd be eaten by almost anything that comes along, uh, and rasps off the algae from the rocks with a very strong fire-like tongue, uh, which, is, um, which supplies it uh, with its food. Uh, the, the sensory organs on, their tentac on the tentacles of this abalone and on all the hair-like structures sticking out on the side of the shell are mostly organs of 
that are able, enable the animal to smell or taste, whichever, you know, it's a bit hard to use the, those words in, for an abalone. Um, and they, uh, they track down their food with the information they get from those organs. Thank you. A, a completely different, completely different uh, sort of organism is the baler shell. And then I think baler shells are fairly common along the coast here. Uh, they um, uh, mostly because of the uh, of, uh, the ones washed up on the beach. Unfortunately, baler shells are rather vulnerable to to trawling and and such activities. Uh, they have a huge foot. This is the muscular foot they crawl along on, like a snail does on the water at home, and this huge um, siphon through which they draw water, and of course they can wave the siphon around like this so they can zoom in, it enables them to zoom in on, on whatever they want to get to. In the case of baler shells, it's other, other mollusks because that's what they eat, they eat things like that abalone that I showed you before. Um, and uh, they simply envelop it with their foot, smother it in fact, no, no poison or anything else in this case uh, operates. They just sit there and, and sort of cover it over until it dies of asphyxiation and then they just eat it. Um, so they're quite high on the food chain. And this is a point that I like to mention because um, with the destruction of these things, people collect them, I know I did once myself, um, for make lampshades and the like out of them. Um, they, their numbers are going down drastically along this coast, not only because the shelled stages are, are being predated, but also because the trawlers and the, and the dredging that's going on rips off their big egg cases, which are about the size of football, um, and uh, rips them off. And once they're ripped off the rock, uh, the eggs that are inside them no longer will develop. And this is uh, really making the numbers go down very rapidly. They're sort of, not quite, but they're sort of like the equivalent of a tiger and the, and the problems that operate for tigers in the world where they um, are being, their numbers are going down. Thank you. In the deeper waters, you get more animals, because there's no, um, pardon me, there's no um, light, or not much light getting down through the deeper waters, uh, there's not algae to eat. And so you get a lot of animals like this particular limpet, um, which eats sponges. And that's how it gets its colour, of course, because it gets its colour. Most of these animals get their colour from the food they eat. Not sometimes unchanged, the colour's unchanged. Sometimes they manufacture it into a different colour inside their bodies. But this little one was caught out off the coast here just a little bit south of the Abrolis, um, out on the edge of the continental shelf just as it started to dip down uh, some years ago when we did a survey out there. Thank you. Hmm? Thank you, okay. Um, another type of mollusk is this one here. It's called a Wentel, it's one of the Wentel trap shells. Um, and they all seem to eat uh, what we call salenterates. They eat things like coral and they eat anemones and they eat all sorts of things like that. Um, and this one's eating this coral here. This, this is living coral and it's actually getting into the body of the coral and eating it. Uh, and uh, and it, of course, ends up with the same colour as the prey it's consumed. Thank you. But when we get right up the food chain, we get to things like the cephalopods which are like this squid, this is one of the um, inshore squids that you would find inshore here, not right out in the ocean, um, which, is, uh, uh, which tend to be mostly solitary sort of things. Uh, most of us see them only when we're on a vessel and there's a light shining on the water and they, it attracts all sorts of things, uh, fish and, and the light to the light. And these squid zoom in and, and uh, make mincemeat of the, um, of the fish. Thank you. But another variation on that high predator uh, uh, way of operating are the cone shells. 
which actually manufacture a poison uh, in their um, in their salivary glands, uh, so that um, they uh, can kill their prey with the with the actual poison, which they shoot out through their through a not this one, but through the, a, a sort of a tube that they make with their lips all joined together and pulled out like an elephant's trunk, something. But that's the, that's a siphon. That's a different thing. But it looks like that, and they can shoot it out and out. They shoot out through their that tube. A, a tooth, a barbed tooth, and the barbed tooth is like a little hypodermic needle. It's hollow inside, and the venom is pushed into that as it's pushed as the tooth is sort of shot out of the the mouth uh, into the flesh of the prey. It depends on what those that particular species of cone shell eats as to how the how venomous the the uh, the uh, saliva is. Some of them eat worms and things like that and they don't need a very highly venomous saliva in that case because worms are fairly um, static. Uh, some of them eat other mollusks uh, and they need a slightly um, more venomous uh, saliva and so you know if you got bitten by or stung by one of those you'd feel that your arm might swell up and so on but it's not going to kill you but this one, this particular species here, the geographer cone, can, um, has a venom because it, its prey is a, a fish. And, and fish being mobile, if a, an animal like this that's relatively slow moving wants to catch a fish, it's got to kill it quickly and so it has a highly venomous poison um, and which can in fact kill human beings as well. So, um, you know, it's that strong because they have to, once they get their grasp on this, they don't want to, the cone shell doesn't want to be flung around in the death throes of the fish, so it wants to kill it straight off. Uh, and this is one that does, does uh, we do find over at the Abrolis. I don't think it's ever been found along the coastal areas here, but it is relatively common in the Abrolis. Uh, next one. The reproduction, I'll have to go through quickly, shall I? Um, Different mollusks have different ways of reproducing. Um, some of them are hermaphrodites, like the sea, um, the sea slugs. Some of them, like oysters, change their sex. Some of them broadcast, just throw all their gametes, their sperm, all their eggs, out into the water and hope for the best, I suppose. And the others mate. And if they, mate, if they mate, they either lay eggs which they put in a nice little capsule which will keep them safe while they're starting off their development. And uh, others go a bit further and actually brood their eggs like a chook does. Thank you. So that this is one of the, um, the nudibranchs, the sea slugs. I couldn't find one with a picture of one with its eggs, unfortunately. But they, they mostly eat... Oh, they eat all sorts of things, nudibranchs, but mostly eat sponges and things like that. And uh, they lay an egg ribbon, a gelatinous egg ribbon, which they fasten to the rock. Uh, it's often in a spiral arrangement, and there are literally thousands of eggs in it. They, because they're hermaphrodite, they do mate, but they don't fertilise their own eggs. They, they only take someone else's sperm. And uh, so their little eggs, when they hatch out, they go, uh, they go up into the plankton and they float around in the plankton community for quite some time as they start their development. Next one, thanks. Um, creatures like these scallops that live in, in the crevices of coral, and this also is over at the Abrolis. Um, <coughs> nudibranchs are practically everywhere, one sort or another, and they all follow the same pattern, roughly. But these little things live only in coral, uh, in the crevices. They're, they're, uh, they'd be good to eat, and so they have to um, make sure that they, um, they, both, they can't move out, so they can't put their eggs and their sperm where they want to, um, and they have to make sure that to protect themselves as they grow, they grow at the rate that the coral is growing. If they got left behind, then the coral would come over, grow over the top of them. 
if they went faster than the coral, if they grew faster than the coral, then they'd stick out and some fish could eat them. So they have, have a, they've got a nice, happy life if they stick to the rules, sort of thing. Um, oysters, like this, this is one of the giant oysters, a tropical oyster that comes down so the coast, down as far as their brothers. It's about that big. Um, I think you've got one in your displays. And uh, it, like most other oysters that we have, um, ha that have been ever examined, uh, change their sex backward and forward, uh, not just once, but uh, in most cases that have been investigated, they go backward and forward between males and females. Uh, and so they, but they broadcast when they, they, the males usually broadcast their sperm into the water, and that triggers off the females to start emitting their eggs, and then it's just lucky dip if sperm and egg meet up with one another. But they compensate for that by producing tens of thousands of eggs or sperm at a time. Uh, the, as we get up the, the uh, chain of it, we have another species of um, cone shell. Um, this one is actually not a very poisonous one. Um, it's, by the way, the one Conus Victoria, the one that they're experimenting with its venom to see if it can be used instead of some of the drastic painkiller drugs that are, are addictive. And it produces eggs which it lays and puts inside these little capsules, little horny sort of capsules, um, and uh, they hatch out as these tiny little shells which do float around in the, in the uh, plankton for a while eating anything that they can find, that they come up against, and when they're large enough, they'll settle to the bottom and then start eating or hoping to eat other um, things like crabs and worms and things. Another one. Cowrie shells, on the other hand, have gone... That Some of the cowrie shells, not all of them, but some of the cowrie shells that we have along our coast, we've practically got a monopoly of this type of cowrie shell, um, they're called zoelas, if you want the name. Uh, they, um, they actually sit on their eggs. The mother, the female will lay them in some sort of fairly um, safe spot and will sit on them like a chook and wait until they hatch. And, they, and because they have a lot of egg, and you might see they're quite yellowish, those little eggs, um, they have a lot of yolk in their eggs and so there is sufficient nourishment for the little... Uh, cowries when they hatch to actually be ready to go off and lead their own lives. They go off and find a, a special sort of sponge, depending on the species, and then they'll sit down and eat that sponge for a long time until they get some urge to move elsewhere. Thank you. But we have... Um, is that about time? But we have these other things, these... We don't get much of them up here, or not massing like this. I've never seen them up in this direction. You see it more down on our south coast. They, these bubble shells get together and, um, and they sort of have communal mating. Um, and then they lay these egg strings. You can see the strings going around. And the eggs, many thousands of them in those egg strings, sort of just hang on to the weed or whatever they're attached to later on. Thank you. I'm not sure if we have time. <laughs> a, quick, a quick run through then. The way these animals defend themselves depends on where they fit in the food chain, or largely it depends on where they fit in the food chain. Um, you get some that have got heavy shells, and particularly ones with spikes sticking out, to deter predators like fish from coming along and eating them because, you know, the, the predator would get these spines sticking in its mouth and presumably that helps to deter it. Uh, next one, thanks. You have these odd little balls, these are little bivalves that have not, not, don't work like that but are flattened out like this and they live in the, on the walls of the burrows of some little um, crustaceans, stomatopods, uh, that burrow down into the sand and among the rubble. And they sit down there, they're protected, the, the crustacean doesn't eat them for some reason, um, I don't know, and they just fatten themselves and get the um, benefit of being in a nice little hidey hole uh, made by somebody else. Thank you. 
um, this is a scallop, this is out at the Abrolis, uh, and, this, and animals like the scallops, apart from being a obviously able to close up their shells, um, have these little eyes. You might see the little blue eyes around here. And their eyes, they, they're not, they won't form an image, but they will pick up changes of light and darkness. And so they're warned that something's coming along and they'll close their shell. And this particular species that lives out on the Abrolis and up in Shark Bay um, has, has always, almost always got a sponge growing on the outside so that even if they're closed up, they've got this nasty sponge. At least I gather it's a nasty sponge because fish leave them alone. Um, uh, to uh, protect them, so they're getting benefit from another creature altogether. This little tiny little cowrie shell, called an egg cowrie, lives on this sea whip that's around, uh, or sea fern, sometimes called, and it eats the outside covering. It's sort of just passing up here and eating all the... the uh, the tissue that covers this particular this is a, this uh, creature is is uh, related to coral and so it has the little polyps that stick out you can see the little purple ones here um, and it goes along eating those uh, and it has taken into itself not only the general colouring of the the um, the tissue it's eating but it's even put spots on it to camouflage it completely against its prey. Next one, thanks. One of the animals that does um, go one step further, and this is a crummy picture, I know, but I couldn't find another one. And this is one of those giant sea hares that you might sometimes see washed up on the beach. Um, you can see them if you dive in, shel in sheltered waters sometimes. They grow to about so big, it's the biggest seahorse in the world. And, and uh, sea hare, <laughs> seahorse, um, sea hare in the world, and we have it along our coast. Not always this brownish colour. Sometimes it's black. Sometimes it's purple. Sometimes it's even a bit paler. And it it has uh, has these wings that are floating out here. But at any rate, it eats alga, um, and it uh, takes some of the certain sorts of algae, um, and it takes some of the uh, chemicals from the algae and trend, makes them into something else which in fact about two or three different poisons uh, that it has then puts into its body so that if something even comes along and licks the outside of that it would get some of the poison that comes out of the skin even more so if it eats them and eats the inside part of it um, which is where they have a gland that produces a a mucus-like arrangement, um, it will even be worse. These were um, the sort of uh, sea hares that caused a lot of dog, well, quite a few deaths of dogs on the Geraldton beaches about three years ago, three or four years ago, um, because the dogs, had, they'd been washed up on the beach, they'd probably finished mating and egg laying, they'd washed up on the beach and the dogs had just come along and mouthed them, not even eaten them, and uh, a couple died. Um, uh, there. A few were very, very sick. Thank goodness the vet, who must have good vets in Geraldton, um, he uh, saw that the, uh, the symptoms were rather like strychnine poisoning, so he treated it, the dogs as if they were, had eaten strychnine, and most, most of them recovered. But it's uh, on another... Okay, go on. And so, uh, and uh, even further elaboration, the next one, thanks, Tom. Um, are the blue ringed octopus and they don't get their poison which they have in their salivary glands from eating anything else. They have bacteria that live in their salivary glands which manufacture somehow, I don't really know, um, this poison uh, and they, when they bite something, either a fish or, or a crab, that's mostly what they eat, crabs, or a human, if they're unlucky, if the human's unlucky, uh, they inject the poison. This is a tropical species, this one with all the rings all over it, um, and it comes down to the Abrolhos Islands, and I have seen it on a beach inshore um, cove, Drummond Cove, thanks again, uh, Drummond Cove, and it's, um, so, you know, it's a thing not to touch if you can help it. 
um, the cray fishermen, the rock lobster fishermen here, had sometimes have a good deal of trouble because they're pulling up the pots and, and the octopus are inside them and get out and sort of start crawling up their legs or something and, and uh, the first thing they know is they've got itchy legs so they scratch it and that irritates the rock lobster, uh, the um, blue-ringed octopus and uh, they're bitten. Uh, again, this venom is extremely potent in this case. I have seen one such blue-ringed octopus up in Broome, same species as this one, um, was in a big aquarium with a sea snake, a really large-bodied sea snake. And it, uh, I'd been looking at this and, and walked away a bit and then I heard a little kid behind me say, oh, look, it's jumped on the sea snake. And I turned around thinking, oh, that's something unusual, I must see this, and walked over towards it. And by the time I got, it was out from here to the back wall, the sea snake was dead. It was like that. So, you know, obviously... Blue-ringed octopus are not really made to get at humans, but they certainly are made to get at predators and things like that. And that's where, you know, because the sea snake's a vertebrate animal, um, it probably affects them much the same as it affects us. I think we'd better leave it there. <laughs> uh, I've gone over time, I'm sorry. <laughs>